It's in the general purpose okay. guides where I okay. thought it would be. Yay. All right. All right. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. My name's Rebecca Graves, and I'm the education librarian, and I actually have my office down at the Health Sciences Library. And I'm Tara Meadowcroft. I also work at the Health Sciences Library. And so today we're talking about um, literature reviews. Um, and I, before we jump into that, I have a question for you all. And for those of you who are online, if you want to put something in chat, um, if you feel like answering is, my question is, have you done a live review before? Um, are you new to live reviews? So is yes, no to having done one before? Maybe you did one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it worked. Um, so everybody's new to doing a lit review, right? Okay, excellent. That's great. Um, and how, is that any chats from online? Uh, new to them, yes, but need to do one. Okay, <laughs> so I need to do one. Um, so next question is, what comes up in your mind? Like what? Are you curious about? Oh, and yes, for the folks in the room, if you need a pen, we have some pens. Anybody need a pen? Okay. And, and you can keep the pen. Yeah. <laughs> if you, anybody wants a pen, <laughs> so, so, um, I'll actually use the mic here. Um, so, what questions do you have about lit reviews? Is there anything specific that you're looking for? Um, I am uh, work with faculty on their grant proposals, so mm -hmm. they have a little review in there. So, I guess most of what I'm looking for for myself is like tips that I could offer to them if they're struggling. Um, but also, it's like how to make sure that, uh, is there, are there any tips for me to like look at a lit review and get an idea just from reading it if they've really hit on the main points that they should be covering. But like how to critique them? You know, because if you don't have that. That's a good question. How to critique your lit review. I mean it's kind of very basic level. Not, yes. not so much content oriented <laughs> right. procedural. To see if they've crossed their T's, yeah. dotted their I's, so to speak. I uh, Jennifer that's just knowing where to search. <laughs> where to search? Okay. Any other questions, specifics? Um, <laughs> so just, did anybody have a question about the, the basic question of what a lit review is? I, okay. So, okay, so there's a head nodding, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't want to start today. I didn't want people to say, well, we, jump, jump ahead, jump ahead. So, um, okay, so. Um, so lit review, I mean, I'm going to start by like who uses them. Um, and so you can use different people to use them. So like, for example, if it's assigned in a class, it can be used by a teacher to see if the student understands the background or has done the background exploration to know a topic. Um, if I'm writing as the writer, so I can use it to show my professor that, yes, I've read the material. I have a broader perspective on this topic. I haven't read just one article or just one book or looked at one data set. I've looked at a broader picture. And I can summarize it, and I can draw a synthesis from it. Um, then expanding that out from the classroom, you can use it in a book or an article to explain to your reader. If the reader's your colleague, you can use it to show your colleague, yes, you should um, except me as a colleague because I know my stuff. You know, I know the background. I know the key sources. I've done a, I have a good scope, a good breadth to my survey of the literature, of the information or research on this topic. Um, if you're talking to somebody outside of your area, it could be a way of catching them up to speed. So maybe you're talking to somebody who's new to the field, or maybe you're talking to the general public. Um, I'm one of those people that likes to read, you know, the, the books that academics write for the general public. And they'll often survey the literature. They'll say, well, this was written and that was written, and we know this from this. 
And so that's a way of teaching me as a general person, um, this is what's going on in the field. This is what we know and how we know it and why we know it. So it could be just for somebody for just personal interest. It can also be if you're working for, if you're trying to educate the legislature, you're trying to educate the public about public health, or you're trying to educate an, an, um, a CEO for an engineering project. Um, you can say, well, this is our, this is a policy paper. Or this, you know, this is what the, it's not just me saying it, it's all my colleagues and the people before me. So it's um, a way of sharing research. It's a way of sharing the conversation that's happened among um, researchers. And researchers, I'm using that broadly. It could be social scientists, could be people researching in the humanities. Um, it could be re researching in the um, medical or the harder sciences. Um, and actually, it's in the sciences that you really find a lot of literature reviews, because what it's doing is it's saying that this is the research that's out there. Um, and I like to make a differentiation of research with a capital R and a small r. Um, this is my own personal one. So take it or leave it. And capital R research, in my mind, is when you go out and you actually create new data. You actually answer questions. And that could be you go out and you survey people in the town about a particular topic. Or you do an ethnographic study and you observe people and see what is their behavior, you know, when certain, I don't know, like, if the police are standing here, do people behave differently than if the police are not here? Do people behave differently, you know, this time of day or that time of day, you know? Um, do dogs, if a dog is present, do people behave differently? Or it could be lab research, could be clinical research. So any type of research that's generating the data, answering the question, I think that is capital R. And people publish that in their primary papers. <laughs> then I think of lower lowercase r research is what is part of this, the literature review. So in the literature review itself, you might be drawing a synthesis, but you're not necessarily doing primary research. You're pulling out what other people know. Just, yeah, so online we have someone say, so a literature review means a narrative that is written about the available literature, not just a search process. Correct. Yeah. So, um, so you can include your search process in your literature review to say, this is where I searched. But then you're going to have to talk about, and this is what the literature is. This is what the research is. This is what the existing knowledge on this topic is. And this is how we know it. And this, and then you can actually add a synthesis to it and say, and this is what we think it means, or this is where it's going, or how you can tie it together and you can evaluate it. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. Um, <clears throat> And I'm just checking my my outline because otherwise I forget them. I kind of go squirrel and <laughs> go totally off topic. So Tara is going to pull up. We have a guide, a library guide on literature review. So she's going to, if you go to your, if you go to the library library.missouri.edu, and then it's underneath course guides down in the bottom. So it's not quite the bottom left, kind of bottom left of center. Not a political statement, just a geographic location on the screen. So quick links, course guides. If you click on that, then you have a list of research guides. And on the left, you see general purpose guides. So there's all sorts of guides on here, and you're welcome to use any of these. And then if you look underneath I for introduction to literature reviews. Now, you can also just search where it says search this, you know, you can search on the page to find it. If you're like, where is it? You forget that path. So, and you can also <laughs> use the URL, and Tara sent out an email to you all yesterday. Um, if you were registered for the class by yesterday. If not, we can send you an email follow-up um, that had a, a link to a PowerPoint. It also has this link, this URL in the email. So you should have that in the email. So this guide will talk about more like what a literature review is and how it's defined in the research. So if you need to come back to it, you can refer back to this page. Um, 
And we also have our Ask a Librarian box. If that pops up, you can always use it to ask a question to the librarian standing by. Um, if not, just close it down again. Um, so, any questions on what a lit review is? Yes, no? Before moving on? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to move on. Um, you're always welcome to throw up your hands or chat in the text box. Um, so the next thing is searching. Like, where do you search? And part of that, I, part of that assumes that you've already come up with your question. So you're going to have a question that you want to answer. And so you need to have your question. And the question, depending on your discipline, needs to be fairly specific. And and part of that is what keeps you finding what you need to find. I mean, if you just have a general um, question about, you know, why do good people fight amongst themselves? That's so general that you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna end up reading cool articles for days and not get your paper done, you know, because I don't know about you, but I actually love looking through the research and following footnotes and stuff. And then I'm like, everything I read, there's like three more things I want to read. You know, so having a defined question actually helps keep us targeted and keep us focused. So that's one thing to look, that would be one thing to look for in a literature review is, is their question focused? You know, especially like, is it not like what's the best method, but is this method, is method A better than method B? Or method A better than no method at all, you know, you know, if you're comparing or not comparing. Um, and then if you're saying in people, well, you know, do you have a population? You know, do you have a group of people? Young people, old people, you know, townspeople, people in rural areas, what have you. Um, so once you have your question, that's going to be your launching place. And then the next thing you're going to want to do is think, well, where would I find this information? Um, <coughs> So, and then what information do I need? So those are two things. So like, um, so I try not to be all medically, because all my search examples are usually the medical nursing side. So I'm trying to like have a broader discipline. But so does anybody have a question they're working on? And to, if you want to jump in. Anybody have a question there? Like, okay. Um, nobody's like throwing questions out there. Like, yeah, work on my question. Work on my question. Um, so if I were looking at, um, um, smoking. If I were looking at issues on smoking in Missouri, like maybe e cigarettes. Uh, we're. <laughs> I've got a question. Okay, for one. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, synthetic voice construction methods, best methods, methods for synthetic voice construction. Oh, okay. So is that engineering? It's, um, yeah, it's speech and engineering. It's I'm helping with right now. We're trying to improve uh, synthetic voice construction for people that are in last little bit more use a voice device. Okay. So methods is a lot of it. Yeah. So the, the question was, methods are improving synthetic speech right. production? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's an interesting one. because So you stop and think, well, where would I look for the information? So you need to create a device. Well, obviously, you're going to have electronics and engineering. So you're going to want to look in, in that literature. And that literature could be journal articles, could be conference papers, could be reports. Um, at this point, they're one step before creating the device. It's um, creating the algorithms, uh -huh. which actually create the voice that then be delivered to the device. It okay. has to do with recording speech and creating algorithms so you can synthesize the speech. Okay, so then you're getting into the computer science uh -huh. literature. So then you're also like, okay, so now we got to pull in computer science. Um, and then you might need to pull in like the communications voice folks. You know, so yeah. you, you get that involved there. So if that makes any sense, what I'm getting at is where you search. So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to jump into Google and search in Google. I mean, I know you guys are beyond that, but I'm using an extreme example. Um, so you might <laughs> think, okay, I need to pick up engineering, I need to pick up the informatics or computing, and I need to pick up 
on um, communication of voice, yes. We also have a question from Jennifer, which is how far back in time would you include if you go five years or ten years or beyond that? Um, oh, that's a great, I love that question. <laughs> as a librarian, I would go back as far as the written record, but that's <laughs> me as a librarian. Um, and that you're probably going, oh my god, that's so much information. Um, part of that depends on what your topic is. Now, if you're doing voice, improving voice recognition or voice production, that's not going to go back as far because of the technology. But it might go back, I mean, it might go surprisingly far back. There might have been something built in the 1970s or um, an algorithm from the 1990s that it actually is useful. Um, so I find the cutoff of five years or ten years arbitrary, and I wouldn't start with that unless you know for certain that your topic and your your idea didn't start before then, or if you're updating it. Like if you say there was this one literature review done on this topic back in 2000. So I know they did, you know, I looked at their methods and I know they did a great job, so I'm going to go from 2000 on. So then you definitely have a time frame you're doing it on. Or if you're looking at something, I don't know, I mean, if you're looking at something like, I don't know, the female condom is a good one. You know, like, that didn't exist before. I'm trying to think that came out in the 90s, I think. Um, so obviously you don't need to go back before then because it didn't exist. Or certain drugs or maybe certain... Um, standards, like if there was a change of engineering standards and anything before that and that standards change, you just don't do it that way anymore, then those would be your prescriptors for date. But if you don't have a hard and fast prescriptor like that, I would wait on eliminating the older articles until later. And part of that comes with cited reference searching. All right. Um, I realize I'm talking a lot about this and we haven't even gotten to searching, so I'm going to have to speed it up here. So. Um, and think where I am. Okay, so looking for information. So you're going to have to think about where do I want to look? So there's a lot of different databases that are specialized. So you have engineering databases, medical, um, psych, education, etc. And you also have a lot of librarians on campus that can help you with those. Um, another sweet thing about MU is we actually have, we have a medical school, we have nursing, we have vet med, we have Engineering, we have a nuclear reactor, we have a we have a law school, we have government, you know, we have government, and so we have librarians specializing in librarians. So um, you're welcome to contact us, and if we can't answer your question today, we'll find our colleague who can help you. Um, so, so one thing is that you're looking for okay, which disciplines am I looking for? Then you're looking at what type of information. So would it be a guideline? Um, or a report? Would it be a journal article? Would it be a conference paper? Would it be a data set? Would it be like if you're looking at, you know, cigarette smoking in Missouri, you probably need to get some demographic data. Um, so when you say literature, literature can be pretty broad. It's not, you know, a lot of times in the English we think of literature as being poetry and essays. But when you're doing a literature review, you're actually reviewing the written work, the written documents on that topic, which is much broader definition. Um, so it could be all of those that I've mentioned before. Um, so the next thing I'm going to jump into is that, you know, we have quite a few different databases. So if you want to. Yeah. So like Rebecca said, a lot of disciplines are here. So you probably won't know which database is for what or which ones are even available. So from the main library page, you can look for databases here, looking for a database. And then from here, you'll get a long list, A to Z. These are all the databases you can do by subject, by type, resources for research, trial databases. So there's a ton. So it definitely just depends on what your topic is about and where you want to research. Um, one good one thing we wanted to show you is when you're first doing the literature review and you're maybe not entirely sure where this stuff is coming from, where to go, where to even start. So we have a great discovery tool, which is our huge database, and it's a ton. It's like it crawls our entire collection, and so you have access to everything. It won't just be 
medical specific. It won't just be engineering specific. It's everything. And then from there, you can you can look at what's coming up and kind of narrow it down more to a specific database or a specific subject. And so, but here's a list of the databases. But if you want to get to, it's called Discover at MU. On the main library page, it's just right here. So you could just type in not your entire search question, but the main concepts for it, or just one concept about what you're looking for. Um, if no one, if, if anyone want me to type in something, this example. If not, I have one. All right, I'm going to use my example. And okay. And while Tara's typing, that would be one thing to look at in a systematic, I mean, a literature review is to where the person searched, you know, like, I, like the scope of their information. So if you're evaluating it, you can say, you know, if they mention where they search, you know, did they search in just one place or did they, I mean, in what type of documents did they include, depending on the discipline. So if, if and how far back they went. So does it look comprehensive? Does it look like they did a, a thorough job? So here, synthetic voice, it's just doing, so just typing it this way, it's just a keyword search. So you're getting really close to one million results, but you can see the first result is a patent. The second result is a journal article. Ooh, a patent for this could be actually Which would be useful. good, yeah. And then we do a specific patent databases to look at. But you can just see all here. You can look on the left down here. It tells you the formats that's pulling up. So you have books, journals, conference materials, biographies, patents, and then there's more. So this definitely just gives you a ton of stuff to look at. Don't be overwhelmed because it's doing all of our collections and then some. And what it's also doing here is expanding your search. Because you're, what you're doing is just discovering right now, that's why it's called Discover. You just want to be able to find all you can to narrow it down. You have these expanders when most databases will give you limiters. Most databases do, this one does too, but um, this expander right here, also, so it's searching within full text of articles, so some databases will search the whole text if they have it available. Most databases don't, they just do the title, the abstract, the indexing, so it's very limited in that way. Um, so a lot of your databases will be not full text. And then, but you can still get the article later on. And then here it says applying equivalent subjects. So not only is it doing synthetic voice, it may find other subjects that thinks it matches and it will search that too. I don't think we found out if it, which ones it actually does. Yeah, it didn't show, we couldn't find a screen that it showed what those terms were. So I mean, it's looking for, True synonyms, but what it considers true synonyms, I'm not sure it's disclosing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, so you're kind of like, eh, what am I getting? I mean, you can take those off. It's automatically going to default to that. But all you have to do is just exit, exit them out. But then from here, you're you're wondering, this says that it goes back to 1212. <laughs> not, who knows if it actually does that. Um, it could be true. It could be some kind of... Well, it could, it could also, it could be that somebody wrote the citation wrong. Mm -hmm. That's um, it, important, too. And it could also, because as Tara mentioned, these will search full text when the full text is embedded in the database or attached to the database. And we did find one where the reference was for 12.12, but it clearly was not. So it was <laughs> it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Like, that article, because it was something, it was something like, it wasn't synthetic voice, but it's like, if you find an article about synthetic voice from 1212, you're like, yeah, I don't think they were really writing about that in medieval Europe or, you know, ancient China. But maybe they were. Is there a way to use the language to find that? Um, this citation? Well, if you go down to that, if you use the slider on the left. So, two. This looks like. It says publisher year 1212, but I'm not sure you could know. But you can look at you can look at the full text, and it'll show you 
maybe why. But this right here, it's tel Bell Telephone News from 1914 to 1915. So I'm not entirely sure why it's a publisher's 1212. Uh, so it, yeah, so if you scroll, does it actually, if you scroll down, it might, maybe it was 1912. And it came up wrong. Nothing's even showing up, but. Um, oh, here we go. It's just taking a while to load. So yeah, August 1914 was when this was this newsletter. Yeah, it would be good if that got cleaned up, and we. It, and I'm wondering if it is because they got the date. You know, the date got keyed in wrong. Because I guess that's the take-home message: is when you're researching. Keep in mind that things can, if humans are behind a lot of this, so things can get added incorrectly. Oh, and actually, while you're researching, um, one thing to do is to take notes mm -hmm. throughout this entire process. Your future self will appreciate it. Um, so write down, I mean, write down, type in whether you're paper-based or online. You can do it in a Google Doc. You can do it in a spreadsheet. You can do it on a sheet of paper. But make a list of what your question is. And then your search terms, because we have synthetic voice and we have generation. There's synthetic voice, one down below is creating, or maybe if you scroll down a little bit. Um, there's method for synthetic voice, well, generate building. So one of them was building synthetic voice. So you might say, oh, okay, I got synthetic voice, synthetic voices, I've got building, I've got generating. So you start getting all these terms and you want to track those terms that you use. And then you want to track, you say, okay, I looked at the discovery tool on the library's page, looked at discover, um, and then I use these search terms. Does this show the search history? Yes. So if you look up there where Tara's clicking, it shows search history, and you see that it captured the search that you typed in. So the databases will track that for you, so you could copy and paste it, or you could send, some of them will let you send it or download it or print it. And so you actually, unless you are done that moment, you're like, I'm good, I'm done, I got it, I got my paper written, I'm moving on. Um, you actually want to track these um, and take note of them. So whatever take note means to you, whether you write it down, whether you copy and paste it, whether you print it, whether you upload it to the cloud. Some um, databases let you, oh, yeah, if you, you sign it. up for accounts, so this one has a My EPSCO host account, if you sign up for one, it's free. You can save all your searches. You can save specific articles. It all saves it in this account. And with this particular one, my EBSCO host, if you, so my EBSCO host has a lot of different databases. So it has all the nursing database. It has psych info, it has psychology one. You save all your stuff in there. So if you're doing a more inter interdisciplinary search, you can save all that stuff in there. And you can see your searches from the nursing database. You can see your searches from somewhere else. Erin asked how long it will save that search history for. For as long as you have that account. Um, we always say never let this be your saved search. The search history, it'll, get, it'll go away. It won't stay. You have to actually physically go in, click this, and hit save alerts, save searches. But as long as you have that account, you have all that safe stuff. Could you back up just a little bit? And you said EBSCO host and account. So, so a lot of databases will have accounts um, that you could sign up for. So this one in particular is database discovered at MU. It's called My EBSCO Host. But you would just go in here. If you were in the Discover at MU database, you would just go in here and hit sign in. And then if you don't have one, it'll ask you to create an account. So a lot of databases will have something like that. Um, some of it just is different for each database. So the one medical database we use is PubMed, and theirs is called a My NCBI account. So always check to see those in the databases, because it's a great place to save your searches. So is there something, like if you're searching in the MUI, is there something that will save all your searches in all the databases? It depends. Like, not yeah, all for well, one thing. Like, this I just mentioned because it's EBSCO. We have a lot of databases with EBSCO. So, if you're doing like searches within a database that looks like this, then you can save each search, but it has to be in like an EBSCO database. I have your notes. 
usually it will look like it looks similar to this setup here and then there's other can't yeah, it, yeah on the discovery one it's hard to see but it usually is. it has EBSCO it does uh, somewhere and, oh. and so EBSCO is a company that has databases there's also Walters Kluwer who's Elsevier and so I like to say EBSCO Walters Kluwer and something else and um, they're like the department stores, like Kohl's or like J.C. Penney's um, or like Macy's. And then the databases are like the particular lines of clothing, like you might have lead clothing or you might have Dockers or you might have, you know, a store brand. So some of them you could get that specific database from different vendors, different providers like EBSCO. Some of them are owned or controlled by that one vendor like EBSCO controls CINAHL, the nursing room. Um, you don't have to necessarily take that home today, but, no, but um, there's a there's big business and all this information, like who owns which database and how many databases they own and how much they control. So there's actually big money in all this. You wouldn't think of it. People don't think of libraries that way. But, um, but it's, yeah. the library, it's nice to know, though, if you see a database that looks similar to this one, it, all your searches from similar da looking databases will show up. But a, that's a good question because a, like a search I'll do, we're going to look at Scopus. A search I do in Scopus won't show up in this one. Because they're different. They're companies. different. You're saying look like this. You mean the screen looks like that? Yeah. Like where it says, where it has the three boxes, where the synthetic voice is, and it has the and and the and. So once and you start searching, search you'll realize that a lot of da databases have very similar looking interfaces. And you'll be able to. Been a big source of confusion trying to figure out the database thing. And you like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we subscribe to me. There's a question online, so. We'll... OK, there's a couple. Uh, can you export search history to Excel or some other program? It depends on which company, which database you're in. So on this one, there's the, under the search history alerts. What are we doing? I see where it says under search history, the word search history slash alerts. Underneath it says print search history. So that doesn't let you export it, but it gives you a free screen to copy and paste. So that's one option. Um, and then if you wanted, I don't know if you do, if you do the share, so this this is a bad example of a database that lets you do it. You can send the results to yourself, only the results, not this nice little box. And you can also export the results into like a reference manager type of program. But as so, far as the search here, as far as the search history, I don't think you can download that to a spreadsheet mm -mm. from EBSCO, but you can if you're searching PubMed. PubMed lets you do it, so it depends. It depends on the database, yeah, database. which is and not I helpful. Think, I think Scopus does, that you can download it to a spreadsheet. So it depends, and it drives us nuts, too. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, why should you save your search history? Um, why should you save your search history? The two big reasons are, one, if you're going to be required to mention it in your literature search. Now, not all literature searches require that. So if it's not required for you, you don't have to save it. Um, so that would depend on whether it's for class and what the teacher's requiring or whether it's for a particular journal and what that journal requires. And if you don't have to give an accounting of where you searched and how you searched, don't need to do it. The second one is for yourself. If, you, if it's going to take you more than one sitting, to do this work, trust me, you will be cursing your present self, your future self will be cursing your present self and saying, why did I not write down what database I was in and what search terms I used and whether I combined them with an and or an or and whether I accepted this article or took that article because um, it's just hard to keep, you can't, it's hard to keep all of this in your head and why would you want to? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> that's why we've been vetted. Um, pen and paper. So part of it is just for your own record keeping and your own sanity to track your progress and to make sure you're not redoing work that you've already done. And part of it is perhaps you're being accountable. So you get to judge those two um, requirements. 
Did anybody have any other questions about um, Discover? Yeah, we went over it very briefly, but it's mostly used for discovering the information. It's the biggest, it's a big database and you kind of want to help to narrow it down. Another thing, if you were interested to see what was pulling up, you can look at the different subjects and then you can see science, medicine, education, India apparently. Um, so you see all these different ones that you're that pulled up. But another thing is here, databases. So you can see where all of these are actually housed. So you have the Hathi Trust, the Science Direct, um, Yale Virtual Reference, stuff like that. So it kind of gives you a, a an idea of where you could go search if you didn't want to completely search and discover. So this one has sports discus, which is like a physical therapy one. Um, psych articles, psychology, Medline, that's medical literature, stuff like that. And and then as far as getting the full text, because you has everybody used the find it at MU? Everybody track down full text articles? Okay. So in case somebody hasn't, if you click if you don't see a PDF attached, there's find it at MU on the screen. If you click on that, it should bring up the article. And this one looks like it is. And so uh, it's saying, hey, actually, it's. Well, a if you ever have that issue, feel free to hit report a problem. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, on the right hand side, report a problem. So this is actually a perfect learning <laughs> moment or teaching moment is that we try to make this seamless and things break. So we actually do appreciate if you report that problem and let us know that it's broken. And if you really need the article, you could also click request a copy. And then, the, has anybody used interlibrary loan? Okay, I see some hands going up. So if we don't have a copy of the article, we the MU libraries, if we don't have a subscription or a link to the article, you can request it, send us a request a copy, and we will get it from another library. And that turnaround time, Grace, is the turnaround time here for one to two days as well? It's one to three, but um, during the week, I find it's usually every 24 hours okay. for an article. So the turnaround time is one to three days, is what we say, business days, but it's you often just within the same day. And it's free to you. The library picks up the cost. Um, and it's all online, so you can request that. You can also request a copy. So another screen that pops up is if it's like says the catalog for our library pops up and it says oh this journal is bound and it's located at the health sciences library it's located at the math library and you don't want to go there you can also hit request a copy and someone will scan it for you and send it to your email so it works so if we don't have it at all and if we have it it's in print and you just want it emailed to you it's a magic button yeah so um, Do you want me to go to Scopus? Sure. Um, and so the next one I thought I'd talk about is, or we would talk about, is Scopus. Has anybody used Scopus? Yes, no? Okay, yeah, yay, you use Scopus. Um, so since only one hand went up, I'm going to give a little intro about it. Scopus is a database that is created by Elsevier. They are big, huge players in the information world. So it's going to look different from the discovery one, which is created by EBSCO. So again, if you forget EBSCO and Elsevier, don't get hung up on those labels. But Scopus is the database, and it actually was started in 1996, but they've been extending the content back. And so they say it goes back to 1823 in certain disciplines. It's actually at least three databases in one. It's got the Biomedical One PubMed. It's got Compendex, which is Engineering and Informatics. So there would be a perfect one for Synthetic Voice, um, which is probably why you raised your hand. Um, and it also has Embase, which is a European database that covers the biomedical. Um, and then it does have some other databases included in it for social sciences as well. Um, so you can hit search. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to search. Um, so, and I'm going to actually, I don't know if anybody, but 
Has anybody looked, seen the book, heard of the book, The Righteous Mind? It, it's a fun, it's, it's an interesting book. It's like why good are divided by politics and religion. So it's looking at, you know, somebody mentioned it to me, and, and, and we actually had a family discussion over this at Christmas, like you do when you're an academic. <laughs> um, and so we had a discussion on whether this author has been discredited. You know, like, oh, no, that's passe. It's like, and then we're like, oh, no, we thought it really helpful. We would hate to see that happen. So it turns out that if you can search on different topics, so one of it is, all right, I'm kind of going off right here. So I'll just, if you read this book and you look at it, in the academic world, what he's talking about is a wonky phrase called moral foundation theory which the book is so much more exciting, which is why I brought in the cover. Mm -hmm. So if you go into Scopus, so like what Tara was saying is that this search screen looks different than the one we were in. This one has more blue. Um, it has where you would click on the term to put in your title, your term. It only has one line, but over on the right you see the plus sign, so you could add more lines. Note that they have an example here. So it shows that if I have a two or more word phrase, I'm going to want to put it in quotation marks. So if I were doing moral foundation theory, I would want to put that in quotation marks for the best search. And then the search to tell it to go ahead and search is down in the lower right. And so I click on search. And it comes back with only 127 documents, which doesn't surprise me, even though this is a huge database, it, it does have a strong medical focus or a strong biomedical focus So in, in informatics. So you're like, okay, so, and moral foundations theory is much more of, a, of an ethical or psych or social um, piece. So, Again, we wouldn't only search in this database on this topic, but Scopus covers a lot of different disciplines that we thought it would be interesting for you all to see it. Um, so again, on the left-hand side, you have your refine or your filter. This Scopus calls it refine. Others call it filter or sometimes limiters. Um, similar idea where you could go by years. We talked about that. Um, you could look by authors. Subject areas in Scopus are fairly narrow. So you could say they have some social science, they have some arts and humanities, you could look at medicine, there's eight business. So you could look at that <coughs> um, and narrow. So you can either narrow to it by selecting it and down at the bottom left you see limit two, or you could exclude things by selecting things you don't want and click on exclude in the bottom left. So you start to see similarities between the different databases and the search screens and you start to see differences and that can help you with your searching, some search tips here. Um, again, you see that there's the find it at MU because you're not going to find, the in Scopus you're really not going to find many of any PDFs attached. You're going to need to use the find it at MU. Um, how would I narrow this down? Now you might go through 127 you might find that that's not horrible to go through. But if you want to narrow it down, you can use this search within results. And so that's, um, let's see, I'm scanning my notes here. Oh, actually, before I want to do that, so I could narrow it down. Oh, like if I wanted to do something like I wanted to do climate, and I can't spell climate. Let's see, I have it written down here. All right. <laughs> and. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So I want to put this in there. I put an or in here. So is everybody familiar with your Boolean, with your ands and ors and nots? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, I throw the hand. Okay, so just remember your ands narrow things down. So I want, you know, voice synthesis and algorithms. So you have to have both together. Or moral theory and climate. Or broadens it out. So I have climate or environment. I might have build or generate. So you want to think about that. And those are some things to take notes for for yourself so that you don't have to, I mean, if you're going to be working on this over time. Um, and then you can also use not to get rid of things. Like if you need to exclude things, that's the not. Um, so just to point that out, 
Um, and then I'm going to click search to go ahead and search on this. And so if I do make this a little bit bigger. Um, so you can see in here that it has, it actually does have some information like moral foundations in Oklahoma, Sharia amendment, um, wildlife contact. Um, here's one moral foundations. And so what I'm seeing is like, oh, okay, that moral foundations theory, if I click on show abstract, that's where I'll find my term. I see, oh, okay, and so you see Jonathan Haidt, that's the guy who wrote this book. Um, so that's how I generated my search. Um, so he's talking about moral foundations theory, but I'm seeing that they're talking about moral foundations. So this goes back to that iterative process of you start with your question and then where do you search, how do you search, what terms do you search on? So I might actually broaden out my search and drop the theory and do moral foundations. So I might come back and back up to that. Um, another thing I can, so I can play around with my terms. Does that make sense? I'm kind of like watching the time. And, <coughs> and um, I need to scroll over. Now, what Tara and I have been doing both in the discovery tool and in Scopus so far has been using either keywords or subjects, terms that would be in the title, the abstracts, or um, index to this. But you can also search by cited reference. So does anybody do that? Okay. Um, so if I have an article or if I have a book, a lot of times they'll have a bibliography or a reference list, and I can look through that um, to find more articles. Um, the trick with that, though, is that it's going backwards in time. So it's going to be older pieces of information. Um, so if you click on, actually click on the whole topic. So if you pick, Scopus is one of those databases, and, and not all databases will do this. If I look at this article, so we just picked one, and if you scroll down a little bit on the screen, keep going, you'll see the references. So this article cited 31 articles. And so it makes it, this is a searching tip. So Scopus will do this. We also have Web of Science. So you can search on your topics in there. And then you can look at the reference list, and it makes it easy to get to the articles in that list instead of you having to key them back into the computer. You can actually click on the title, or you can click on the Find and Um And you can also see that these articles have been cited themselves going forward in time, but then scroll back up to the top. And then in the upper right, you go up, you can see that this article has been cited by four articles going forward. So in addition to this article itself, you can look at the 31 that they cited, plus the four citing them going forward. And this is what I like to think of as the conversation among people in this topic. So you can jump into the conversation on this and say like, oh, who's talking about this? And what are they saying? And what does it mean? So that's another way of searching a new question. How did we get to this screen? Okay, so we click, so you pick a reference that looks relevant, you click on the title, or you click on that link, and it, this is the detail, the, the record for this one screen, or the screen for this one record. <laughs> if you wanted to read all 31 references, um, how to get this article. Oh, how to get this article in the upper left where it says find it in MU. You can go ahead and click on that. And we are having a problem with Science Direct today. I don't know what's up with that. But if we had it. Mm -hmm. But usually this is the thing if you, you see this, you can report the problem. They'll send you a copy or you request a copy. If we had it online, it would take you right to the article. And we are going to follow because it's yeah. I've left them up. Great. If you go back, click on find another one. And what was your question? Oh, the thirty. So if you the thirty one on here. So if that thirty one, these references are what actually. If you go up, what um, I'm trying to like Wolosko oh, and those three authors had put in their paper. So if we were to get that article. Their reference list would have those 30 lines. Um, okay. 
Um, so that's another way of searching is to do the cited reference, and Scopus is a good database to do for that if it works for your subject discipline. I mean, if it doesn't cover everything. Um, there's also Web of Science, which we currently subscribe to, which you could try that. And Google Scholar also does cited reference search. Not plain old vanilla Google, but Google Scholar will do cited reference as well. Um, CINO, which is a nursing clinic, somebody who signed up for the class is in nursing. There's one called CINO. That actually will do cited reference, but it's a smaller database, so you're not going to find as many, but it, it could be uh, useful to do that. Um, Let's see. Some other tips on searching. If you scroll back up to the top uh, and click on, if you click on search at the top center of the screen, um, Scopus actually defaults to. Oh, actually, Tara has it scrolled up, and there's the search history down below. So in EBSCO, the search history comes up in the middle of the screen, but in Scopus, it's down there, tucked away in the bottom. So question. Um, how comprehensive is Google Scholar versus databases like EBSCOhost or Scopus? That is a big question. <laughs> Google Scholar is a black box, so we don't really know. Um, we know that, for example, PubMed is, a, is up on free courtesy of the National Library of Medicine, so it's up on the web free. And so Google Scholar includes all of that because they can crawl it and pull the information. We know that they work with um, professional associations and publishers, but we don't have a full detailed list of who it is. Um, and we don't have a list of, like, Scopus would list all the journals that they index in what years. Google Scholar doesn't do that. So it it's a black box. I mean, it's when we've searched in it, we found quite a bit of data, so it's pretty comprehensive. But it's hard to know where its boundaries are because they keep it proprietary. Oh, so I was going to go on. So in the search, I just put in that phrase. And you, and if you, so if you see the search box of search line, and it says article, title, abstract, keyword, and that's the default fields that Scopus will search in. Different databases will have other default fields. For example, if you search in PubMed, it does all fields, which would include the authors and the author's affiliations. And this is what's called field searching. So you can actually specify which field you want to search in. Like if you have something that's really general, you might want to, especially when you're discovering it and first starting out, you might want to search the article title. Um, you might want to search the abstract um, to see which where it is. Or you might be searching by author. Maybe you have an author that you know writes a lot on this field and you want to search by them. So you could search by author. And you can do this in the, like, the EBSCO databases such as Discover, um, CINAHL, etc. You can do it in, in a lot of these different databases. You can search by field. So this is another way to target your search. Um, and again, that whole taking notes um, because you did you search the default fields? Did you search only by keywords? Did you search by title, by author, etc.? cetera? Um, when you're looking for a job, you might want to do a search by affiliation to search for that department or that institution to see what they're doing, what the research is, to see if you'd be interested in that. And then if you're interviewing with them, you can say, hey, I know that you're working on these projects. Um, or if you have competitors, you can check them out, too. Um, Let's see. Let me see. Yeah. Um, did anybody have any questions on searching? Anything you want to know about that we didn't cover? Okay. Because if there's not, one thing we wanted to talk about is managing your references. Um, so, how many of you use a programs such as EndNote or Zotero? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm seeing some heads shake yes. Have you used any? Okay, so I've seen somebody say no. Um, which ones do you guys use? Zotero, do you, is it working for you? I think so. <laughs> I think to work with more to, to really answer that question, but I think so. Okay, which one? Yeah, Zotero also. Okay, so 
Zotero and EndNote and Mendeley, actually the pens that I handed out have Mendeley on them. Those are all software programs that capture these references. So the citations that we were looking at, you can, whether it's a journal article or a book chapter or a book, etc., you can download those references into your um, reference manager, whether it's Zotero or EndNote. And so it's one way to gather information and to organize it. So that's one thing that it does. The second piece that it does is it works, all three of those work with Microsoft Word to generate your in-text references and your bibliography or your reference list of your paper. And it will do it according to whichever style you select, whether it's APA or um, MLA or Turadian. Um, you can select those styles. None of this, all of those three are, are good sources, but none of them are perfect. So you'll still have to check it. I mean, because um, they, they still won't get your dishes done, and every so often they'll make a mistake, and you have to fix it. Um, we do have guides on them, like EndNote and Zotero. So there's an EndNote guide, so if you want to try that out, you can test it out. Um, we also have a guide on Zotero. EndNote is a fee-based, you actually have to pay for it unless you're an MU student, in which case campus we have a, a license that you can download it for free as a student. Faculty have to pay $30, um, which is actually cheaper than what it costs off the shelf. Um, Zotero is free and it's likely to stay free because of the institutions that created and maintain it. Um, so if you're into freeware, Zotero is good. Zotero is actually better at grabbing things from the web. So for example, if you need to get documents that, like, and I want to be specific about this because everything's on the web that we've been talking about today. So they're all equally good with journal articles and books and stuff like that. But if you need a web report, like a CDC, the Center of Disease Control page, um, Zotero is better at capturing that. Um, so up to you, you know, do you want something that's free? They're both free as an MU student. Um, so a lot of people say the Zotero one looks a lot like the iTunes, you know, setup. So if you're really proficient with iTunes, you might say, hey, that lowers my learning curve. Um, I actually find Zotero does a slightly better job with APA. Um, so I might lean to it that way. Um, another deciding factor might be if you have a whole bunch of colleagues or classmates that use one over the other, you might want to go with what they use because then you can all bootstrap each other and you can help each other with your questions. Um, we do have some classes on those coming up. Um, let's see, Mendeley is the first one on the 10th, which is next, next week. Um, and then Zotero the week after that, and then EndNote in two weeks. Um, what did you use Mendeley for? I'm not very familiar with that at all. Mendeley is the same thing. Mendeley lets you grab your citations and then it works to put them in Microsoft Word. I, I think Mendeley is probably, I haven't checked it in about a year, but it was the weakest as far as doing the reference, the citations, but it was the strongest as far as allowing for group collaborations. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, it depends what you want to use it for. If you want to use it for small groups, like a lab to share, or a, group, a research group to share papers, it could be good for that. Um, although EndNote's just up their game on that. They compete with each other. Um, any questions? We don't really have a lot of time to go into those, but I would, again, that's part of the taking of the notes. And if you have to, when you're doing a literature search, or a literature review, you're going to have a lot of references that you need to track. So we recommend that you check one of these out. You don't need to get all three. Just you know, might want to like look at them and say which one makes the most sense to you, and then learn that, or which one do you have the most colleagues using. Um, and then use it, put your information in it as you go, and then it can help you when you're ready to write your paper. Um, we're, out of time, so I wanted to ask if there are any questions, that we, anything you wanted to cover that we didn't cover? I feel like we had so much that, you know, there's like, oh, we could keep talking about searching and we could keep talking about and uh, Zotero. And, um, so any questions? 
You do have um, in the PowerPoint for everyone who has it, we have links to this directories page, which is you can contact your subject librarian for help. Um, and we're on here. So all the librarians by their specified subject are on there. So if you need help, they'll be able to help you with the, the searching. And librarians, we live for questions. Mm -hmm. That's our, our job description is we answer questions. So we want your questions. And if anybody didn't um, get the PowerPoint. the PowerPoint or the URL, if you want us to contact you, I'll put a sheet of paper on the table over there for people to write their name on. Um, and if you are online, you can send, you know, in the chat, send your name. And then we can send that out to you if we missed you. But if there's no other questions, you're free to go.